we got people still joining, but um, this one is probably one of my favorite talks. I think it's something that often gets overlooked. Um, there's a lot to cover in this one. Um, I'll stay a little bit longer for questions if needed, though. I often get the most questions about this type of talk. Um, for an outline here, I want to go over a little bit about the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea, as well as like what tests do we do and treatment options for it. We're going to talk about that relationship of all sleep disorders and neurodegenerative disease, but be focusing mostly on obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and then we'll talk about some medications for sleep related problems because those are uh, important to consider in many of this in this patient population. So I always like to start out with a case. So this is a 76-year-old uh, with three years of memory problems, and there's been an increase in irritability, some day-to-day -day fluctuations uh, with her symptoms. Um, so some good days, some bad days, which we often hear. Uh, she's got a past medical history of hypertension, atrial fibrillation, BMI is in the normal range at 24. On uh, review system, she has just mild daytime sleepiness. If you do like an Epworth sleepiness scale, she scores low at a two. Obviously that is a self uh, questionnaire though, uh, or sometimes filled out by the, um, by the uh, loved one. For uh, some of the other history, at least, you know, talking with her husband, she does have some snoring on most nights. She's sometimes waking up with night sweats and then has uh, urination at nighttime, three to four times per night. Her neuro exam is within normal limits, um, but on a cognitive screening evaluation, she scores in a mild dementia range, so 26 out of 38 on my short testamental status, and missing points on both attention and delayed recall, so, so memory-based uh, issues. Her MRI scan, so one thing we see this, if this is the front of the brain, the back, and the two halves of the brain, Along the ventricles and within the white matter, there's quite a bit of vascular disease, moderate vascular disease here is how I would consider that. Her hippocampus structures look pretty normal. She's got these tiny little perivascular spaces, which we can commonly see uh, in patients. And it's important to note what are some of these vascular risk factors, right? We think of high blood pressure, which she has. We think of high uh, cholesterol. We think of diabetes, smoking, one that often gets overlooked though, is obstructive sleep apnea as far as one of these risk factors. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of an overview, this is like a very detailed uh, example of what a sleep study can provide to us, right? So we measure oxygen saturation here in the top. And so we're looking for dips below 90 and 88%, uh, which are concerning. Um, you can sort of characterize apnea and hypopnea events, whether they're central or obstructive in nature, central arising usually from the brainstem. Um, and then we can measure body position, you know, which are they in the supine position, lying on their back, are they on their side? So there's an accelerometer that can help measure that. And then we can look at what pattern, uh, you know, of sleep or wake that they're in. Sometimes we can even, you know, if you use EEG leads, you can even tell, uh, are they in, you know, um, which stage of sleep. We measure heart rate because there's often a corresponding adrenergic response or a almost like a fight or flight response in patients that are having drops in oxygen throughout the night. So we can see corresponding increases in both blood pressure and heart rate, and then obviously measuring snoring decibels as well. So these are the types of things we can measure. Um, for this individual, we did a home sleep study. So it's it's a little bit less information than uh, than kind of an in-lab one, but she had an AHI, which is an apnea hypopnea index of 33.1, which um, 42 of those were on her back, or she had a 42 uh, index on her back and 31 um, on her, you know, in another like side uh, positions. This is indicative of severe sleep apnea. So anything over 30, um, no clear positionality. There were all, there was obstructive and central sleep apneas present. And so it was recommended that an in-house polysomnography test, uh, particularly to help titrate a, a CPAP and, and what was likely going to need to be a BiPAP given the central sleep apnea is present. So um, that was recommended for, uh, for the next steps. And so, you know, in, in, if we could say anything nice about COVID, one thing that has happened is we've gotten pretty good about doing sleep studies at, at home, uh, you know, not requiring to have to come into a lab. 
Um, there are many benefits to consider about uh, home sleep studies. So patients can sleep in the comfort of their own bed. You know, if you look at a lot of long-term sleep studies, you know, sleep studies of following patients over three, four, seven days even, they'll often throw out that first night of sleep because there's a disruption when you're in an unfamiliar environment. The brain's vigilant in this unfamiliar environment. Um, so, so it's something to keep in mind. Um, the accuracy of home sleep studies are pretty good uh, for most patients. Uh, some of the limitations, though, is if it's a very mild sleep apnea, the home sleep study can definitely undercall that. So you may miss some cases in the more mild range. Um, and so obviously, if suspicion is high, like if this individual is very sleepy, there's a history of snoring, and the home sleep study is borderline, then, then a more formal study would be recommended. If they're having technical difficulties doing the study at home, um, then obviously an, an in-lab one is recommended. One negative aspect of this is you can't, at least currently, most of the home sleep studies don't have a mechanism to capture REM sleep without atonia, which we need EMG leads to essentially, um, you know, to essentially measure muscle movement during REM sleep. So you can't capture that without the in-lab in most cases. Um, and then we usually miss more detailed EEG leads, which can capture sleep seizure activity. So those are some things to keep in mind. When we look at sort of the prevalence of OSA, it obviously varies by your study population and your definition of what is sleep apnea. Um, this is sort of a looking at multiple different studies across the years uh, with women being on the right side and men on the left. And you can see how this prevalence ranges anywhere from 10% to 40% for men, lower, much lower in women. And all of a sudden there's this study of looking at 50%. So it, it varies a lot, right? And when we think of the US uh, in 2013, a, a pretty good paper kind of estimated it was around 26%. So it's pretty high prevalence. Um, and that's in adults age 30 to 70. Um, this number increases with age though. Uh, so it's it's higher in those over age 70 actually. Um, and so the, the thoughts too, as our population becomes uh, more overweight and obese, then that's gonna increase the numbers of sleep apnea as well, because that's one of the major risk factors. So how does this tie in with uh, neurodegenerative disease or memory disorders? There's, there's quite a bit of evidence that amyloid has associations with sleep problems, so amyloid plaques in the brain. If you look at folks that on longitudinal studies that have amyloid plaques in the brain, they're much more likely to have excessive daytime sleepiness and vice versa. If you look at those that have reduced sleep time, so usually insomnia with, with sleep time less than six hours, they have an association with increased uh, amyloid positivity as measured by an amyloid PET scan. And the idea here is that sleep apnea is also associated with increased uh, amyloid loads due to a, de a decreased clearance problem. So I'll try to explain that a little bit. When we think of the timeline, and I've discussed this in other talks that you can always review on our YouTube uh, site, but if we think of the timeline, there's this amyloid phase that's happening five to 20 years before somebody develops clear clinical symptoms in sort of a mild cognitive impairment or dementia range. Um, so there's, there's potential risk factor modifications that we need to be strongly considering of what drives this amyloid um, accumulation. And so when you think about Alzheimer's disease in general, there's this bi-directional effect uh, with sleep apnea and Alzheimer's disease. So we know that Alzheimer's disease, patients with Alzheimer's disease start to have fragmented sleep. They have less slow wave sleep if you measure their sleep um, at nighttime. And then, you know, there's, there's this really high, there's so a one study measured uh, for folks that had mild to moderate uh, dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, uh, that 90% of them had sleep apnea with 22% being in the mild range, 29% in the moderate range, 39% in the severe range. Um, so there, there's this, this idea that even just having Alzheimer's disease already puts one at higher risk for having sleep apnea. Now, chicken or the egg, right? There's a lot of questions there, but I think there's a pretty clear link that we need to be thinking about testing these folks, especially when they're having increased uh, sleepiness. Um, there's this new concept you may have heard about called the glymphatic system. So it essentially is a, uh, a drainage, a washout with the spinal fluid where it drains from the arteries. And it basically there's all this interstitial fluid between the neurons and the cells that get washed out through the veins. And so that's part of the wash period that happens at nighttime when we sleep. 
there's lots of things that can disrupt this. Uh, so, you know, when we think of it helping clear all the junk of the day that we build up when neurons are firing and communicating, uh, what disrupts this flow? Well, vascular disease disrupts the flow. Um, sleep apnea can disrupt the flow. Having these amyloid plaques present can disrupt the flow. Neuroinflammation, which can be a reaction to the amyloid plaques, can disrupt the flow. And that's just to name a few. So when you look at um, this lymphatic flow, when does it most commonly happen? Because we can measure this, uh, we can measure this in people that are sleeping, right? You can measure that that flow and, and when it's clearing. And this mostly happens in the slow wave of sleep, so the deep stages of sleep. And this is what aging and sleep apnea disrupts. So if you look at somebody that's young, they're entering this REM sleep, it's usually somewhere between 10, 20%, sometimes 30% of the time. Uh, and so we can see the brain fully relaxed. If you measure with an EEG, the hertz go down to like three to four hertz compared to like eight to nine hertz in a, in a REM stage of sleep. And, uh, and so you can see that is more common in young folks, but that's also when we see the highest amount of lymphatic flow. So that drainage um, potential. So in, this is an overdramatization. So I, I, this is not what like a, a healthy old uh, older individual would look like, but there is a reduction in REM sleep as we age. This is accentuated though in folks that have sleep apnea or Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to touch on another concept that's important to, re to remember here. So there is a change in melatonin as one ages, and so it's why it's one of my first line uh, treatment agents for our, our folks that are having sleep issues. Um, now, if you Google this, and many of your patients will, uh, Dr. Google will tell you that melatonin really peaks in early childhood, and then it just like plummets, right, uh, where older individuals are producing negligible amounts of melatonin. Um, looking at some studies, uh, this is not entirely incorrect, but it's probably more likely there's a lot of in inter-individual variability, and there is a reduced production, though, as one ages. And, you know, what does melatonin do? Well, it basically is produced in the pineal gland, and it's uh, either inhibited or stimulated by the amount of incoming light. So that's what helps regulate our circadian rhythm. And, you know, one of the things that we see, if I look at a CT scan of somebody, like a CT scan of the head, I can look at their pineal gland and almost guess how old they are based on the calcification. So we see a lot of calcification of the pineal gland as one ages, and there's reasonable suspicion that that might have something to do with the melatonin production um, with age too. Um, and part of this might just be due to sleep cycles changing as our brain develops and then as it's not developing at later ages. So we go back to our first case, right? Um, that individual had severe sleep apnea. They titrated um, a CPAP in, in house and they didn't have worsening of central sleep apnea as they actually stayed with a CPAP. They were able to titrate the AHI down to less than five. Um, and this individual had been wearing it um, for a good amount of time um, and being adherent with it. At the year follow-up, their cognitive testing was six points improved from previous. Um, you know, that's still abnormal. It's still in the mild cognitive impairment range, but it was still significantly improved from her previous uh, test. With extended follow-up though, so as I saw them back two years later, that memory and daily function was uh, starting to worsen. And so the, the spouse was having to start to help with some of these, what we call activities of daily living, right? Um, and uh, was noticing more and more significant memory issues. On further questioning, the patient had stopped using their CPAP about eight months ago. They weren't noticing any benefits, so stopped using it. And on cognitive testing, their score dropped from 32 at the last visit down to 20, so even six points lower than the first time I tested them. We get a repeat MRI scan. Uh, those hippocampal cysts are still there, but you're starting to see more atrophy within the hippocampal structures as well. So there is suspected to be a neurodegenerative process on top of, you know, obviously the sleep apnea that was going on. So this is a, obviously something where there's, there's two things going on, which is very, very common uh, as we get older, right? It's not always simple. When we look at uh, some, so the, so the best study that I've found was one that was published in 2021 in sleep, um, looking at obstructive sleep apnea treatment and dementia risk in older individuals. So they looked at a large amount of Medicare, uh, Medicare beneficiaries with sleep apnea. This was a three-year retrospective study. 
Um, I will tell you up front that their uh, their definition of adherence to CPAP is very, very minimal. Uh, it was just whether they uh, the individual refilled their CPAP equipment or their PAP equipment at least twice in a three year period. So so even with this very low bar um, of adherence, uh, we saw a significant effect of those that were that were using that that, that met this criteria for adherence. Um, they're they had lower odds of all cause dementia when you looked at that uh, three year period. So the odds ratio being 0.69, and that was even lower for a diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia. So you can think of sleep apnea. You know the way I explain it to patients, it's it's sort of like untreated sleep apnea is like gasoline on a fire, right? If you've got a neurodegenerative disease that's developing in the brain and then you have repetitive hypoxia events at night, you're not getting good restorative sleep, that's just an accelerant um, to the disease. So CPAP quote unquote failure is, is very, very common. It's, it depends on which study you look at, but estimates are somewhere between 40 and 50%. Um, I think that if we did better counseling that with that that rate might not be quite that high. Um, you know, if we highlight the importance of brain health, of overall cardiovascular health, um, the reduction of risk of converting from MCI to dementia or developing dementia, I think that this adherence would go up, right? If it, if patients are, you know, I, I I feel like I you could like sort of divide patients into thirds. There's like a third of patients that recognize that boy, this is a dramatic improvement in my quality of life. And then all of a sudden, those are the folks that could never go on vacation without their machine. There's, there's a third of folks that don't notice whether it's helping or not. And there's a third of folks that just want to throw a machine against the wall, right? It's just like this claustrophobia inducing. It actually worsens their sleep, right? Um, and so it, we really need to address that middle third, right? Those third that um, are not sure whether it's helping or not. Those are the ones that I think this counseling would really help um, increase the adherence with. Insurance compliance is an issue. So if they're not using it, um, you know, a certain amount of time, then, then they're going to be requested to send the machine back. Um, follow up with sleep specialists and, and people reviewing this is important, especially if there's needs for mask changes, mask leakage. Um, this is why we need sleep specialists and follow up over time. Um, there's lots of other reasons. There's congestion from allergies, septum, deviated septum problems, and then the claustrophobia that I mentioned. And so what if my patient stops, you know, CPAP, are there other options, right? So if it's mild and it's positional, like let's say they only have apneas while they're on their back, then, then sleeping on the side may be enough. They have body pillows and wedge pillows and things that you can try to keep somebody more on their side. Patients will tell you, oh, I, I fall asleep on my side, and, but they roll over, uh, but unless there's an obstruction from them rolling over. Uh, so that's one option. Certainly weight loss is a big one. Um, we all hear, oh, I'll, I'll go ahead and lose weight with diet and exercise, but that the success of that we know is not great. For those that are over a BMI of 35, then bariatric surgery is an option. Dental applications are better than nothing. Um, they're costly. They're usually not covered by insurance, and they can loosen over time, so they do require follow-up, um, uh, you know, so, so that, that's uh, closely monitored. Um, I, I did not remove, or I did not uh, mention one here. There are some nasal plugs that you can wear that basically help prevent some sort of backflow pressure to keep airways open. How well those work are debatable, uh, but might be better than nothing. Um, surgical removal of tissue. So if that's part of the issue that's, you know, from the tonsil area, it's like a small airway problem, uh, that's an option. And then there's this newer one called the Inspire device that um, that you'll hear about. So this is essentially a pacemaker for the throat uh, and for the airway, right? So um, one downside of this, especially in patients that have cognitive impairment, is that it requires anesthesia. Usually they actually have to do an endoscopy first to see um, if this is an individual that it might help with. Um, and then, uh, and then you know, you have to have a a major surgery where they're implanting a pacemaker with leads going to these muscles. Um, but I have had it. So, so there's kind of this stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? If somebody's got severe sleep apnea and I'm worried about the risk of developing dementia, maybe the anesthesia risk is, uh, you know, certainly less than untreated sleep apnea. So that's something to strongly consider. I've had a number of patients that have done it now and, 
have had success with it. So um, that's kind of to be determined for most of our patients with cognitive impairment now. Um, so just to briefly do one more case here to, to talk about management of these other sleep issues. So this is a 68 year old with two years of progressive cognitive issues. Um, neuropsych testing shows a major neurocognitive disorder, or you can call that dementia, um, with executive visual spatial and memory do domain impairment. So we have multi-domain impairment. They've got a history of insomnia. They've got sleep apnea. They're not using their CPAP. They've got severe REM sleep behavior disorder, as reported by the uh, the spouse. They've got constipation, lightheadedness upon standing. They've got increased daytime sleepiness. They're starting to see shadowy figures out of the corner of their eye, and they've got restless leg syndrome. They've got all sorts of sleep problems, right? Um, they're on 10 milligrams of denepazil at bedtime uh, for their, their cognitive disorder, and they're also taking Tylenol PM at bedtime. On their neuro exam, uh, they've got some mild mass spaces, which is really just reduced facial expression, and they've got decreased arm swing on the right, so some very subtle, mild Parkinsonism. I, will, I won't make you guess, but to cut to the chase, I diagnosed this individual with probable uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. And so there's a couple of, of management-related changes that we'd recommend here. So for the REM sleep behavior disorder, this is usually due to brainstem nuclei that are involved in Parkinson's and Lewy body disease. It's these Lewy, body, Lewy bodies that form in the brainstem that are part of this, uh, the damage to those structures, which are supposed to paralyze the muscles during REM sleep so you don't act out your dreams. Um, and these, these symptoms can precede Parkinson's and Lewy body disease by up to 13 or 15 years, uh, but sometimes they they match closer to when cognition is, is impaired. So one tip is to move the denepazil to the morning time. We want that drug peaking while someone's awake. Uh, and one of the side effects is it can mess with insomnia and REM sleep. Uh, acetylcholine is part of that thalamic cortical uh, um, structures that are important for REM sleep. And so if you're having acetylcholine increasing medications peaking during nighttime, it can really worsen uh, vivid nightmares and uh, and REM sleep behavior disorder. Melatonin is our first line agent for RBD. Um, so it does suppress the amount of REM sleep that one has. And this works in about 50% of cases. And we don't have to necessarily worry about any cognitive impairment here. So there's a range of uh, doses that we recommend. And sometimes patients will say, hey, I'm doing great for six hours out of the night. And then the last two hours, I'm acting out dreams like crazy. So in those cases, we recommend like a timed release formulation of melatonin. If that's not enough, then we add on low doses of panazepam, and that works in 90% of cases. So that works very well for most patients. For uh, the insomnia, so in this individual, we'd want to stop their Tylenol PM because it has anticholinergic effects. We would want to consider first-line agents being melatonin uh, again, and then uh, the second-line one is trazodone. So that is, is a cognitively neutral sleep aid that, that we're mostly comfortable with in the memory clinic. Um, SSRIs could help with any sort of mind racing anxiety causes. That's also what trazodone tends to help with as well. You could use mirtazapine. It does have some mild anticholinergic effects, but it has some benefits of appetite stimulant in some patients. There's some reports that it could worsen REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, cannabidiol is being tested. I don't have any strong opinions one way or another about it, but it probably helps reduce anxiety in some patients. Um, I should mention too, there's prozosin is indicated for folks that have nightmares, especially related to PTSD, and that can help in, in some patients for that. Um, for the daytime sleepiness, right, it's really getting this individual back on CPAP, right? You, you can only do so much for daytime sleepiness if you're not treating the underlying sleep issues. Um, but for folks that do have, are using their CPAP, that is FDA approved to start something like modafinil for daytime sleepiness despite CPAP uh, treatment. And so that's the one that's been most studied in Lewy body disease. So that's what I usually will utilize. Certainly you could consider other stimulants um, uh, in this patient population. And then if we're getting beyond kind of the things that I've talked about here, then I'm getting a, a sleep consult, usually a sleep neuro consult, given the fact that there's a lot of neurology involved here. Uh, for restless leg syndrome, the pathophysiology is not well understood. 
there is this relationship with iron levels and dopamine synthesis that we think uh, is a is an overlap with these syndromes. So I, I do find that many patients that um, have Parkinson's disease also have a restless legs component, um, and it probably has to do with something of this dopamine synthesis. Um, for non-pharmacologic strategies, so regular cardio exercise, especially four hours before bedtime, can help promote sleep and reduce the restless leg symptoms. So this is good for brain health anyways. Um, good sleep habits is important, avoiding caffeine and alcohol before bed. Sometimes counter stimulation uh, of the legs can be helpful. Um, so they even have like these pads that you can rest your legs on. Um, warm, tub, warm tub soaking and magnesium supplementation have been tried. We do try to target the ferritin, so that's usually what we recommend measuring. And if they're not above 50, then we recommend iron supplementation. That's sort of the first line treatment for restless legs. And then certainly you can use dopaminergic agents, uh, things like primipexol, ropinerol, but these have some significant side effects. About a third of patients can develop compulsive behaviors. Um, and there's a high risk of augmentation, especially if you utilize high doses, meaning they start to get symptoms earlier and earlier in the day. Um, there is a new patch out that is way too expensive, uh, but it seems to be much better tolerated and it helps uh, fight against this augmentation issue. And you can use carbidopa levodopa, but has um, higher risks of augmentation. And then gabapentin can be used as well. And in severe refractory cases, sleep specialists will use benzodiazepines and opiate medications. All right, so that's, I'll go ahead and in there, just as a summary, we have um, you know, these sleep problems are highly prevalent, uh, especially if you look at Alzheimer's and Lewy body disease. Um, and there seems to be this bi-directional effect that we have to keep in mind. And there's this strong theory that um, if we look at risk factors of Alzheimer's disease, especially that sort of amyloid positive phase of the disease, right? Um, we should really think about sleep apnea assessment and treatment as a primary prevention strategy. And I think that's something that we need to take more seriously. And I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions about that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Just pulling up the sleep. There's just pulling up the uh, chat. So a couple of questions about the code. Does insurance cover home sleep studies? So that's a good question. Um, they do. And, and actually, I've had to fight the opposite, Crystal. Uh, <laughs> one time I, I ordered a in-person sleep study so I could assess for both sleep apnea and REM sleep issue. And they said, well, why have you not done a home sleep study first? Uh, and, and I had to explain that it's because I'm trying to look for REM sleep issues also. And so I actually had to, to do a uh, a one-to-one -to, -one to get that approved. Um, but yeah, they absolutely do cover home sleep studies. Um, you do have to put indication-wise uh, that an individual has snoring, daytime sleepiness, you know, some sort of indication of why we're getting the sleep study. Um, another question here. So how do you treat insomnia with fragmented sleep for patients who have trouble maintaining sleep? So that's a good question. I mean, I think one of the issues... Uh, you know, I, I put in that first, uh, I put in that first case study a little clue that so sometimes when folks are increasing their urination at nighttime when you have nocturnal urea, that's actually probably some evidence of spikes in blood pressure throughout the night that people are going through these uh, these adrenaline surges because whenever you have an increase in blood pressure, you have an increased filtration through the kidneys as well, and so you know especially if you got somebody waking up with night sweats, but uh, um, even just increase urination. So increasing head of the bed, right, is one strategy for, for fighting some of that uh, increased flow through the kidneys. Uh, but then there's obviously some agents that we sometimes use to reduce um, the, uh, the nighttime awakenings, but that can be a common problem with, with just aging in general, with prostate enlargement, and then you throw on neurodegenerative disease that uh, this fragmented sleep, especially from Frequency of urination is a very common problem, but um, you know, there's a couple strategies to try to address it first. And if the, uh, you know, if if they're, you know, if it may be just a time release melatonin addition of trazodone that might help prevent them from waking up if all those other things that we've discussed are addressed first. Um, but there's not really a medication specifically that uh, is like. Oh, you have to use this one just to, to, 
you know, to uh, help the fragmentation of sleep, but it could be untreated sleep apnea is the, is the way to do that. Um, so let's see, we got another one here for um, any thoughts about some of the new anti-obesity drugs and OSA? Uh, Michael, good question. I don't have any specific uh, thoughts on those. Um, I, I assume you're asking sort of from a, just if, if we reduce obesity, would that help OSA? Like, are these, I, I don't have, I don't have much knowledge on how well those work, uh, you know, as far as an anti-obesity drug. Um, I think the, the, the majority, you know, if we had increased exercise, increased um, dietary habit changes, that would solve a lot of the issues because it helps promote sleep as well. Um, and so, yeah, so you're saying early studies suggest 50 to 20% body fat loss. Um, yeah, I think that's great. Uh, I don't know what the side effects of those are or if they would have any implications, but the idea is that if you have a patient that's, you know, a BMI greater than 30, you could get them to a BMI of 24, right? that would drastically um, reduce their sleep apnea because the majority of the um, risk is due to, it, we usually say neck circumference larger than 16 centimeters and obviously being overweight or obese. So the more that we could drive our population to normal BMI, that would reduce the incidence of OSA. But there are plenty of patients, you know, I have plenty of patients with a BMI of 22 that have early Alzheimer's that have sleep apnea. Um, and some of that's maybe from a narrow airway, some of it's just from the physiology in the brain, um, but it is, uh, I think from an overall population standpoint, if those drugs do in fact work that well, then that would be hopefully a reduction in OSA needs. And uh, so Vernon Rowe uh, sent me a message that, um, so the beta um, NP contributes to nocturia. Uh, yeah, and I think that's part of it, um, you know, I didn't specifically touch on this, but there's this triad. Um, if you look at folks, if I see a patient that has these little, um, you know, perivascular spaces in the brain on their brain scan, and then I find out they've got atrial fibrillation, I mean, there's such a high percentage of that. Those folks are going to have sleep apnea. And there's this, this triangle of, um, you know, cognitive uh, risk, heart risk and sleep apnea, right? And, and the sleep apnea drives a lot of atrial fibrillation as well and in in that sort of overall stress on the heart. And, uh, and that's a stroke risk as well, untreated sleep ap or untreated uh, you know, atrial fibrillation. So um, I, I think that there's a large overlap with a lot of the vascular risk factors in sleep apnea. I have my own little theory that, you know, and this may or may not be true, but, you know, when I was a resident taking calls uh, in the ED, there, there's a pretty large proportion of wake up strokes, right? There's a pretty large proportion of wake up heart attacks and early morning heart attacks too. And some of the thought is, is that untreated sleep apnea, right? Um, and, and I think there's a, there's a reasonable uh, link there. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any new questions. We're a little bit over time. I thank you all for your attention and, uh, and good questions there. So the next one looks like, thank you, uh, is October 28th, and we'll have our uh, navigating the driving discussion. So all right. Have a good rest of your day and weekend.